My name is Steve Ekstrom, and I'm the host of the new podcast series, Business Class, a travel industry podcast from the Tourism Academy. After more than 20 years working in the travel industry, I sold everything to become a full-time tourist. Today, I'm in the unique city of New Orleans, Louisiana, and I get to go behind the scenes with Daniel Hammer at the historic New Orleans collection. He shows off the art in his office and much more. Like that's one of the things that you know most people don't get to see. What's it like in the mm, museum director's office? What? Yeah. What do you think is is fascinating? Okay. So we can start over here. All right. Um, yeah. So I have a beautiful office. I'm very privileged to get to work in this office. I spend uh, happily spend my days here. It's really uh, lovely, and I have some wonderful art from our collection on the walls. And so this piece is by William Woodward. He was an important New Orleans artist. He and his brother actually were both artists. Uh, and they were the, uh, uh, they founded the arts, uh, the Newcomb Art Program, as well as the Tulane University School of Architecture, William Woodward did. And this painting uh, by William, who painted many views of the French Quarter, shows the uh, Napoleon House, as we call it today, uh, originally built by the mayor of New Orleans, uh, Nicholas Girard, also known as the Girard House. Uh, but it shows it from a point of view that's not actually possible today, because as you see in the foreground, there's some rubble. And this is because the uh, square that he's standing in had been, at the time that he painted this painting, completely demolished in order to make way for a gigantic courthouse, the courthouse of the state of Louisiana that was built there at the time. And so this painting would have been painted between um, 1909 and 1911. So after the square had been completely demolished, so all of the uh, ancient buildings of that square had been torn down and before the new building had been erected. And so the um, creation, the building of that building of the courthouse actually um, was a very important moment in the history of the preservation of the French Quarter. So it served as kind of a clarion call to the preservationists, uh, such as the Williamses, who uh, kind of rallied to the cause of preventing other such buildings from being built, other such things from happening. Uh, the Williamses were a bit later. They built their, they purchased their buildings in 1938, but there were a number of, uh, of other preservationists who, uh, who really became active after the courthouse was built. And the Ducare Commission, which was established in the state constitution of Louisiana in order to uh, ensure the preservation of architecture in the French Quarter, was established in 1936 uh, in response, in part, to, to the courthouse being built and other things that were going on at that time. It's interesting that, uh, you know, the courthouse was a, is a structure, it's a Beaux-Arts structure, so it's a giant marble building with classical characteristics. And this was a style of progress in America at that time. The city beautiful movement uh, was going on all over the country. Beaux-Arts style buildings were being built by the federal government, state governments, in order to promote the further building of such modern structures. And so the idea with a building like the Louisiana Supreme Court building is the state builds this giant building, and then smaller operators, smaller builders will follow suit. The city will come in, private businesses will come in, and they'll also do the same thing. And so there's only one other example in the French Quarter, there is only one example in the French Quarter of that happening, and it is the, um, it's our building, what is now our building. So the courthouse built by the city of New Orleans in 1915, just after the Supreme Court of the state was finished, um, is also a Beaux-Arts style building, although less grand. And the city built it, it tore down a much older building to build that building. And so it's a little bit ironic that uh, many decades later, our institution purchased that building in order to put our collections, the collections of our founders and everything that had grown from those collections, to have a place to put those growing collections. So Excellent. it's interesting. Um, I should probably not talk for quite so long on every painting. It's <laughs> okay. We, you know what? We go through an edit, so it's exactly. perfectly fine. Uh, so this is um, a painting by a, a New Orleans artist named Douglas Bourgeois called uh, Burning Orchid Nightclub. 
and it depicts the nightlife scene in the French Quarter in the 1980s, in the early 1980s. It was part of an ex it was in an exhibition that we did when we opened our exhibition center at 520 Royal Street in 2019. We did a inaugural exhibition called Art of the City about uh, art in New Orleans uh, from 1984 to uh, post Katrina, and this was one of the uh, key images in that in that exhibit. It's a incredible uh, document of uh, the nightlife scene in the French Quarter uh, in that at that time, uh, and uh, you know it's just I I love to kind of look at each individual character and uh, and. Uh, and see all the different faces. It's. Uh, Do you have a favorite character? Do I have a favorite character? Uh, I, I think that probably most of all, like this guy here, is kind of relaxing, the white uh, kind of I don't know outfit, I guess, with the hat. He looks relaxed. A lot of them look kind of angsty and um, anxious, maybe. Uh, although most people look really happy, but he looks serene, and so I like that. And then I'll let you go ahead. And sure. So this is oh gosh, I'm not going to be able to tell you the uh, every detail about this piece because I don't recall the that's okay the name of it. But it's uh, this is a an art piece created by an artist named Terry Weldon, who actually worked at the Historic Worlds Collection uh, as a preparator many years ago. Uh, but he's a local artist. He has a number of pieces around town in uh, public art pieces, uh, and this is a piece that uh, that he created that we were fortunate to be able to add to our collection. And the medal? Oh, the medal is uh, a medal that we received, a uh, medal of appreciation from the uh, New Orleans Black Chorale, which is a, uh, a singing uh, a music uh, group, a choral, choral group. Uh, uh, and we, uh, we uh, invited them to participate in a musical program that we do with conjunction with the LPO. Uh, every year called Musical Louisiana, where the LPO gives a concert on a, where the music is all according to a theme in Louisiana history. And, and we work, uh, our staff and collaborators, to develop the theme and the program for that, for that annual uh, um, program. And so this was a, uh, after their participation in that, they gave us that little medal. Excellent. Can we get a little glare off the window in a second? Should I? Okay. This is a print of an original artwork by a British artist named Robin Reynolds, who um, created this work in commemoration of the tricentennial of the city of New Orleans in 2018. And the piece ended up being part of our Art of the City exhibition that also featured Burning Orkin Nightclub. And so Robin uh, drew this uh, really incredible um, rendering of the, uh, of the city floating as an island kind of uh, above this pageantry of history that starts uh, around the time of the founding of New Orleans and goes to the present day. So it's 300 years of the history of New Orleans. And each individual uh, item in this pageantry is a uh, representative of some anecdote from history uh, from those 300 years, each of which was researched by Robin in our collections. And so when the piece was on display, there was actually an interactive that went along with it where you could uh, press on uh, each individual uh, uh, drawing and, and pull up information about, uh, about what it represented and the objects in our collection that, that tell that story. Okay. And then I definitely want to do this one. Okay. Because I think you know, it stood out to me and it caught my eye. Yeah, great. I love it. Good. Uh, so... Um, this is a, uh, one of my, probably my favorite piece in my office, and it is a acrylic uh, representation of mud created by a uh, preparator on our staff, Lindsay, Lindsay Rowinski, who um, uh, made it kind of as a labor of uh, distraction when the pandemic uh, first began. So we had an exhibition in 2020 called Cajun Document about... Uh, uh, Cajun culture in um, uh, in South Louisiana, and that exhibition opened a few months after the pandemic uh, had started in March of 2020. So when we were shut down completely, uh, that ex exhibition was still in production, 
And so Lindsay uh, kind of worked on this mud deck, as she described it to me, as a way of just kind of keeping herself busy and coping, I guess, with the, uh, with the lockdown. And so she made it really perfect. <laughs> and so when I first saw it, when the exhibition was installed, I was really struck by how real it was. And so um, I asked her after the exhibition was over what she thought about framing it so I could hang it in my office as an example of the incredible um, skill that goes into so many of the details of our exhibit that uh, are often not noticed by visitors and in many cases are actually meant to not be noticed. You know, the work of museum preparators is often uh, purposefully hidden. You know, the way that a object is mounted in a case is most of all meant to show the object, not the mount. And so a lot of skill and, um, and uh, a lot of precise skill and knowledge goes into creating those things. And so I thought that this mud deck was a really cool representation of that. And so I keep it here in my office as kind of an illustration of the, uh, of the extensive professionalism that goes into everything we do. Do you want to show how it was used in the... Sure, yeah. So these are some uh, pictures. Is this good? Yep. These are some pictures of the, uh, of the mud deck at, at work. Uh, this is the case that it was in. Uh, and in that case, we had a pair of shrimp boots, uh, customary shrimp boots uh, displayed. And so you can see them, see them there. Uh, and here's another shot. So, yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Is there anything that you want me to ask? You know, make sure I ask about before we get started. Oh, I thought you were going to ask me if I was a unique or interesting character or if I was an executive. Yeah, well, you know, we can do that. That's a great start. Which is it? Uh, gosh, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> probably. Probably an executive. Um, is there anything I want you to ask? Yeah. Or gear the conversation toward? Well, you know, I am interested, I guess, in expressing that aspect of our mission, which is about um, drawing people to history and culture in the French Quarter in order to raise the significance of that for a greater number of people who are in the French Quarter. That, you know, that, um, that the French Quarter is now, at this time, you know, predominantly characterized by uses that are potentially detrimental or are detrimental to its the sustainability of its historic identity. You know, a lot of the things that go on in the French Quarter are wearing away at its historic fabric, its historic identity. And you could see a point in the future where the historic identity of the quarter was so masked or so deteriorated that the French Quarter would be no longer considered to be historic by a lot of people or by the majority of people. So I think that we try to combat that by providing access to history and culture for people, you know, easy access so that they can, more people will layer the interaction with history and culture onto their French Quarter experience. And that over time, if we're successful with more and more people, that will help to promote the sustainability of the historic identity of the quarter, which is very important for New Orleans. You know, if the quarter loses its status in the majority of people's eyes as a place of historic value, it could be very detrimental to the city because the city really relies on that so much for, you know, a lot of the, the biggest sector of its economy, for its tourism economy, and its convention business, and so many things that are important to the city. Did you grow up here? Uh, yeah, I grew up in New Orleans, so I was uh, I was not born in New Orleans. I have to admit that I can't claim nativity. I was born in Boston, um, but I was eight when we moved to New Orleans, so I only remember New Orleans. What was it like growing up here? Um, gosh, I, you know, my memory is so spotty, but I can say that I recall very clearly when I left New Orleans to go to college, being extremely proud to be from New Orleans. You know, so much so that when I got to where I went to college, which was in Portland, Oregon. I was so busy feeling special because I was from New Orleans that I think I probably missed out on a lot of great opportunities in Portland to enjoy that city. You know, I was so convinced of the fact that it wasn't as great as New Orleans that I think I 
you know, didn't realize until it was almost time for me to leave that I had actually failed to, you know, have uh, some great experiences that I could have had if I had just been more, you know, open-minded or open-eyed. Uh, so I was very, very proud to be from New Orleans and growing up here, you know, I think a lot of that, ha I, you know, in high school, I definitely remember being out and about a lot and kind of doing things that were probably quite unique to New Orleans, going to see live music, uh, uh, doing things that high schoolers in other places weren't able to do. Uh, and so I think that was for a couple of reasons. Of course, it was more widely available in New Orleans, but also New Orleans was very late to change the drinking age to 21. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about the first time you realized that New Orleans was as special as it is. The first time I realized New Orleans was as special as it is? Well, like I said, I had this kind of idea that New Orleans was special that I kind of left New Orleans with. Um, and I think that uh, that was sustained by people's responses to me when I told them I was from New Orleans. So I definitely discovered when I left New Orleans to go to college. And then I spent a few years away from New Orleans. I was in my mid-20s when I came back. And so when I went, I spent, I lived in Germany for a few years. And so I spent time in a few different places. And invariably and always people were enthralled when I told them I was from the world. So everybody had some reason why they thought that that was really great. And so I um, was struck by uh, how people thought of the world. And living in Europe, um, it was very striking because that was often something that was in contrast with their feelings about the United States. So people would, I would meet people, they would ascertain that I was an American, they would be critical in some way. And then, and this was in 2003, you know, Iraq war, all this stuff. And then I would tell them I was, they asked where I was from, I was from New Orleans, and then they would go into this thing about how that made me different than in their eyes, that I would have been if I had been from anywhere else, essentially. And I always thought that that was kind of strange. I mean, I thought it was, it was nice for me, don't get me wrong, it, you know, made my life easier, I guess. But uh, I always felt that that was a little bit uh, uh, under-informed on their part. Do you think New Orleanians are different than folks in the rest of the country? And if so, how? Well, uh, New Orleanians in general are, I think, very conscious of their identity as New Orleanians. And I don't want to... I don't know how it is in other places so much. So I don't want to say that that isn't the case in other places. But I do think that New Orleans have a very strong sense of the fact that they're in New Orleans is an important part of who they are. Um, and that is a uh, fact that um, expresses itself differently in different people. And so that it's not that everybody who says, I'm a New Orleanian, means the same thing when they say that. There's a great diversity of definitions that we hold, us New Orleanians, about what it means to be a New Orleanian. But the common denominator seems to be, in my impression, that it's very important to all of us. And so uh, I think there's a strong kind of love of uh, place among New Orleanians, a love of home. Um, Although I shouldn't even say love because it's, I think it's also, it's just a strong sense of identity. You know, it's not always necessarily a positive thing, but it's a strong sense of identity uh, with the place that they called home uh, that all New Orleans have that I think is, is part of the reason why New Orleans has developed such a strong definition outside of New Orleans, why so many people from around the world feel that they know about New Orleans is because I think that the expression of identity has, uh, has be, is, is something that we've exported uh, around the world. Mardi Gras is a great example of that. What do you do for Mardi Gras? Do How I do you celebrate? Well, uh, 
we on Mardi Gras day we always uh, either boil crawfish or barbecue at home, <laughs> depending on the crawfish prices. Um, and so we don't really go to parades on Mardi Gras day. I do get up early in the morning with my kids. I have young kids, and we go to see the Zulu parade, uh, which starts at eight a.m. So we can get in and out in time to get home and still get the crawfish going and have the crawfish ready, you know, by early afternoon. But um, we used to go out, my wife and I, and with the kids until they were a little bit older and, um, you know, go in um, costume and, and go out and about in the French Quarter and in the Meridi neighborhood and uh, just kind of be among all the revelers. But uh, when the kids got to be about three or so, we, we, we kind of started just doing it at home and then we kind of discovered that we really liked it. <laughs> so, so that's, that's what we've been doing uh, now for a while. Um, we go to, uh, you know, the course of the weeks leading up to Mardi Gras, we go to a few parades, but we're not, uh, we're not like, we're not among these people who go to every parade. You know, there's a lot of folks who just like, I have so many friends who, uh, they go to every single parade and, uh, you know, no, no, it's not. Awesome. <laughs> um, you mentioned a sense of strong sense of identity. Uh -huh. How do you think that sense of identity influenced the creation of and sustaining a facility like this or an organization like this? Well, our uh, origin as a organization goes back to. Two individuals, our founders, General Kemper Williams and his wife, Leela uh, Williams. And they were uh, people who just put a very high value on um, the things that they thought were interesting and beautiful, and a very high value on sharing those things with other people and kind of um, um, helping them to see things the same way, I suppose you could say. And so, you know, those things that they were interested in were. Uh, history and, um, and the historic ambiance of the French Quarter, which they saw uh, at a time when a lot of people didn't see it. So this was in the first um, uh, half of the 20th century. They purchased the buildings on Royal Street uh, that are the original location of our museum in 1938. And uh, this was a time when the French Quarter was um, thought of by most people of the Williams's circle. The Williamses were you know, wealthy people who uh, lived in the circle of influence in, uh, in New Orleans and South Louisiana. Um, most people in their circle uh, thought of the French Quarter most of all as a place that could be best uh, used by changing it, by making it modern, by tearing down the old and replacing it with something new. Um, and so the Williamses were among a relatively small group of people who thought differently who thought that the French Quarter had, despite its, uh, uh, its deterioration or its uh, poverty uh, or its you know, population of people who you know, weren't then, despite those things, it was something uh, that had historic value and uh, aesthetic value. And so they um, sought to convince others of that by moving in. You know, they, per they sold their home uptown, they moved into the French Quarter, and they started inviting people uh, <laughs> uh, four or five times a week. They would have formal parties, you know, with 20-plus dinner guests, uh, bringing them into the quarter to socialize, to what we would today call to network, uh, to do those things that they didn't themselves associate with the French Quarter, but which over time, over the decades, they did indeed begin to. And so you see from, you know, in the 1940s, the 1950s, into the 1960s, you see the French Quarter change from this place that people of the Williams's circle perceived as being better changed than preserved to being the cornerstone of America's most interesting city. And, you know, this thing of great interest, of great uh, value because of its romanticism, because of its history. And uh, that became the cornerstone of New Orleans' biggest, what became the biggest industry here, tourism. And so it's not that the Williamses started it all, but they were part of this thing that was going on at that time that 
did start it all. And that thing was rooted in their sense of identity with the place. You know, it was interesting and beautiful because it connected with their history. It was their home. It was the his, the buildings were representative of the long history of, of of this place that their family called home, and they thought that there was something important in that, and that should be also shared with the with the rest of the local population, and eventually that became the world too. So, give me three reasons why a visitor to New Orleans should put this on their itinerary. Well, uh, okay. First of all, it's super fun. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting and engaging. I shouldn't say it's super fun because it's really, well, it is, but it's, it is, um, you know, coming to uh, a historic place like the French Quarter and engaging with the history of that place there is an experience. And I think that that's something that uh, can't be replicated, um, you know, you know online, for example, you know, there's a, there's a real experiential value to engaging with history and culture in the place where that history and culture is native and, and where, where it happens. Um, and so, you know, New Orleans is a 300 year old plus city. Uh, it, uh, it, it holds all of the history of this country, essentially in one way or another all of the challenges and all of the triumphs are kind of written on the streets and the buildings of New Orleans. And as the oldest section of New Orleans, the French Quarter, that, uh, you know, it's, it, that's most of all true here. And so to visit, to make going into the French Quarter a museum going experience, that really is, I think, an important way to engage with history and culture in a way that is uh, edifying and and, and interesting and, and often also fun and really enhances the visit. Um, the second reason is that it, um, it helps sustain it for the future. You know, there is really, uh, it is the case that um, historic places are historic only because we think of them that way. Uh, and the only reason we think of them that way is because it's written there right before our eyes. And if we you know, over the millennia, history has always been, you know, rewritten as it's been covered up. Uh, you know, history gets rewritten because we find out new things from the past, but it also gets rewritten because we hide things that used to be apparent. And so, you know, certainly a historic place like the French Quarter uh, is, uh, that could happen here too, I guess is what I'm saying. And so if we don't, as uh, New Orleanians, uh, take care to uh, enhance the historic characteristics of the French Quarter and uh, the way that those uh, relate to everybody's history, you know, over time, the other ways that the French Quarter gets used, uh, both by locals and by tourists, will, um, will erode the historic fabric and, you know, eventually could be erased enough that it was no longer really a historic place, that that would be very problematic for New Orleans for many reasons. Uh, but most of all, because a city really depends on a city that has such a strong sense of identity, or a city can only have such a strong sense of identity if it has something to root that in. And uh, uh, that would, yeah. That would change. That would change a lot about the city. Yeah, it would, uh, you know, and I think that Everybody who uh, thinks of themselves as a New Orleanian or as someone who cares about New Orleans, you know, would probably regret to see the thing that they associate with that disappear. So we all have an interest in ensuring that it is sustained. Tell me about your pin. Ah, it's shimmering and it's caught my attention. <laughs> this is a pin uh, that we that is a historic New Orleans collection pin. The, the symbol is a compass for us from a map in our collection. It's from a map by a map maker named uh, Jacques Tenas uh, from uh, 1814, unless it was 1816, I'm forgetting when the original was, but a map showing the city of New Orleans uh, as built and also as planned at that time. So the French Quarter and some of the surrounding 
areas, the Faubourg Treme, the Faubourg Marigny, the Faubourg St. Mary, which is now the CBD area. Um, and uh, so this is a map in our collection. And on that map uh, where the river is shown, there's a compass rose. And this is the compass, this is taken from the compass rose from that map. Very neat. Yeah. Um, if folks want to learn more or plan a visit, how would they do that? Uh, well, uh, they should visit our website, first of all, uh, hnrc.org. And there's lots of information there about how to plan a visit. We are um, free and open to the public, so there's no charge for admission. But we do offer people opportunities to uh, reserve um, time to come and visit. Uh, since the pandemic began, we've had some capacity limitations in the name of safety. So uh, it's not necessary to book a ticket in advance, but it's possible. So people can plan their visit that way on our website. Uh, but there is no charge. Uh, but there are also lots of things that we do programmatically, both in person and online, that people can find through our website as well. Uh, I really recommend that people sign up for our uh, e-newsletter, which has been a great um, success for us since the pandemic. We have a very high level of readership, and we put out a lot of original content about different themes in history and culture in New Orleans through our e-newsletter. We have a blog that we call First Draft, uh, where our staff is always uh, writing new and interesting things about all sorts of subjects related to New Orleans and Louisiana history and culture. Excellent. Steve Ekstrom, executive producer and host. Sheena Works, chief learning officer. Eric Ludi, development. Keith Snow, advisor. Sifa Mbabu, intern. Esther Kunzoni, intern. Special thanks to Group Travel Odyssey, Daniel Hammer, Teresa Devlin, and Two Train. Uh -huh.